Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to see you tonight for this event. Um, people are still joining, but we're going to kind of start slowly with some intros and while people join. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping, if you could maybe try to keep yourself muted for the beginning, just so that we can hear the introduction and we can hear the videos. Um, and we might manually mute you if you if you're causing some noise, but um, definitely later on in the event, feel free to unmute and either speak out loud or in the chat because um, we want to have a great discussion with you. Um, so I am Sarah Chapman and I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Media Burn Archive, which is based in Chicago. Media Burn collects, produces, and distributes documentary video created by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. This event is part of an ongoing free series called Virtual Talks with Video Activists, which create conversations surrounding the way that media production can spark social change. We're so pleased to be presenting this event in partnership with the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'd like to thank Professor Dan Morgan for his assistance in coordinating the event. Um, so tonight we are gonna be featuring media activist and maker Dee Dee Halleck, and we will be moderated by film scholar Avery Laflamme. We just discussed the pronunciation before. Didi um, is going to be presenting and screening an overview of her career in independent media, beginning with her first film, Children Make Movies, in 1961, mm -hmm. and continuing through her work in the 80s and 90s with Paper Tiger Television and Deep Dish Satellite Network. So Avery is a PhD student in cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. His research centers on black filmmaking, specifically amateur and documentary film practices, as well as historical and contemporary film exhibition. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our guest tonight, Dee Dee Halleck, um, who is a media activist who began making films in the 1960s. She made children make movies in 1961 and several portrait films. In 1971, she cut negative for Winter Soldier, and a very important anti-war film. She then founded a film workshop at Henry Street Settlement and then at um, and New York State Youth Correctional Facility. In 1978, she was president of the Association for Independent Video and Filmmakers, AIVF, um, initiating a campaign to make television public. This work ultimately led to ITVS and grants for production funds for independence, the POV series on public TV, and other independent series. Um, Didi founded Paper Tiger Television in 1981, which operated as a collective for almost four decades. In 1986, Paper Tiger rented a commercial satellite to distribute to public access stations around the country called the Deep Dish Network. Didi was outreach producer for the 90s TV series, working with Media Burns founder Tom Weinberg and others, programming for a maverick network of over 100 public television stations. Um, Didi's films and videos have been shown in museums and festivals, and her book Handheld Visions has been used in many media classes. Before the iPhone and ever since children make movies in 1961, she has taught literally thousands of people to make their own images and tell their own stories as a professor at UCSD, at elementary schools, senior centers, and in girls media tech workshops in Harlem. So we're so pleased to have you all here tonight. And I'm going to let Didi um, introduce children make movies. And we wanted to um, point out that this um, spotlighted video, which I will spotlight, um, is showing you where Dee Dee is right now in the Catskills of, of New York. So Dee Dee, please. Hello. Hello there. It looks like a lot of my friends are here. So I'm glad to be, I'm glad you tuned in. Uh, this was the sunset today. And um, I wanted to show you um, what I was doing all day today, which is tapping trees and I have, maybe put the camera, is the camera on, my camera? Um, I have a big bucket of, of sap, and uh, the, if you hear a, a kind of hissing noise, that's the sap boiling. So maybe we can take off the, I don't know, if we take off the picture of the, we take off the landscape. <laughs> Where's me, anyway? I, th I think, uh, Dee, you might have to go to the bottom left of the screen and click start video. Potentially on your screen. Imagine that appeal of a Brooklyn that oh, yeah. was more oh, fresh sorry. air, more outdoors. Right. And I, I could really see it in that same. Mm -hmm. 
Dice, los únicos que Perfect. haven't been defunded. Got it. It looks okay. like we see right. you. Okay. There's my cook stove right there. And um, I I'm going to show you the sap boiling away. There's the sap boiling. Now two of these buckets come that it takes two full buckets to make this much this much syrup. So it's uh it's it's 40 to 1 is what the uh is what the ratio is. So that's uh sort of like editing video, right? Um anyway. Uh the first film we're gonna show is uh Children Make Movies, which was made when I was 21 and uh was made in New York City at a uh, it, the basement of a housing project on uh, Avenue D and Houston Street. And I had seen films by um, McLaren, um, <clears throat> who had it from the Canadian Film Board. And uh, the, I showed them to the kids, and they wanted to make a film like um, Norman McLaren, who was the great. Canadian animator and um, and what he would do was paint directly on film. So this was in 1961 and um, I think the film explains how we did it. So we could start the film. The kids wanted to make movies. They see movies all the time. They see them in their homes. They see them at school. I showed them experimental films. They wanted to know all about them, how they were made, why they were made, what they were for, how, how they run, how the projector runs. So I, they made one of their own. I brought in some, uh, a whole roll of leader, and we rolled it out on ping pong tables, and I gave each child a straight pen. It's a bit difficult medium to work with. The pens are just regular sewing pens, straight pens. And they're very tiny and hard to hold, but I, I was quite amazed at how quickly they were able to use them. They first, their first uh, attempts were mainly just sort of scratching off, scratching around on the film to make sure that they were getting through the emulsion. And then they would hold it up to the light and see what they had done. Then they took the inks. These were, we used felt, the felt tip pens, the so-called magic markers, <laughs> and, and went over their scratches and when held up to the light or to a film projector's lamp, produces very beautiful transparent colors, which can be very easily controlled. Children make movies. Uh, there's a second part of it, which also is based on a Norman McLaren film called Neighbors, um, which was made by the Canadian Film Board. So, anyway, but um, so at, that was a kind of a, a experiment, and the fact that we shot it, we were able to. Um, make it into a real film that had a soundtrack, etc. And um, the, the film all of a sudden became kind of famous within a, a certain group of people who at that time in history, um, Norman McLaren was teaching at Fordham University. Uh, there was a whole burgeoning uh, movement to teach media. Um, and there was a priest named uh, Father John Culkin, who, who was a big, uh, he, he started out as a priest, he ended up giving that up, but uh, he, uh, he used to hold these huge conferences with uh, English teachers and, they, uh, and a lot of nuns from Catholic schools. 
and they would um, learn they would learn how to talk about film and it was the first real effort to do media education. Um, and he loved this film and showed it at all of his conferences because he felt that uh, that it should that not only should people learn to um, discuss and analyze film, but they should also be able to make film themselves. And here was proof that kids could work in the media. And um, and it so a film that only cost us $88 to make uh, became, uh, it was distributed by contemporary films. Uh, it was shown in many conferences and even at a UNESCO conference in um, Norway in 1962. That was the first uh, conference that UNESCO founded that was really about media education. And it was the only film shown there that showed kids making films. So uh, I was very uh, involved with children. Um, it, it made, and I taught at Henry Street Settlement. I taught arts and crafts, but I also founded a film club there. And, um, and then in 1976, we had a conference about youth made media because it was sort of, it was like the last time that film was uh, used because people, once video got, uh, got a hold in 78, uh, it, by, by 78, 79, their video, there were small enough video cameras um, that people would, they were like VHS cameras, cassette cameras that, pe that people could use with kids. There were, um, their, their porta pack came in 68, 69, but um, that was a little heavy for kids to carry around. But there were some uh, other cameras that were developed and that's um, what the, um, it, it's what happened um, in that there was this rush to um, to make video once that started and but in the meantime in 1976 we held this conference and people showed the films that they had made because there were a lot of teachers that were making super eight films and um, and they um, it was an international conference held at Minnewaska which is a beautiful Quaker resort in the Catskill Mountains. And the, all of the text, the audio from that conference um, is archived. And if, if people are at all interested in that, um, I can give you the, the, the links to it. The, there's, a, 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 there, there's a website that's being developed about youth media and, and, and the, that, that historic conference is going to, to be there. Uh, uh, at least the audio track. Um, so after, uh, after the work with youth media, I also taught at a reform school in New York State um, and um, at Otisville School for Boys. And I worked there for four or five years um, and they were, um, they made beautiful films. I, there is a website. If you look up Otisville Film Club, uh, the the guys didn't want to call it. Uh, they 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 wanted to hide the name Otisville. Well, the 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 state insignia. We used to go out with a car that was the state car, and it had a big state insignia on it. And the guys made a, um, a, a cardboard sign that said Otisville Film Club. And when we would drive out, we all, they always brought some gaffer tape and they would tape over the state sign um, with their insignia, with, which uh, said Otisville Film Club. And, uh, and we would go into Middletown, which is the closest town to Otisville 
different places. Um, we we and they they made these beautiful films that were shown many places. And I always would take a bunch of the guys there. There we showed at the Kiwanis Club. We showed at the, the, the Middletown Library. We showed films at um, many conferences at Grossinger's when there was a conference on um, youth incarceration. And I brought the guys there and they showed their films. So um, it was a very, very intense, wonderful time for me to really I learned so much from these guys. I, they were wonderful. And uh, I, 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 we were both kind of learning film together because aside from painting on film or scratch film, I hadn't done that much filmmaking. And, um, and, and, but they, did, they would write scripts in the class and then um, we would uh, try, to, try to see if we could arrange to take them off ground, which they had to get permission to do. Um, and then um, we would film it. And then once they ed they would totally edit it. And um, there's a, you should go to Otisville Film Club uh, dot blogspot dot com. And there's a, um, there, all of their films are there, except for the Super 8. There were hundreds of Super 8 films that they made. But they also worked in 16 millimeter, and I did get the 16 millimeter films digitized. So, but that's that part. So after uh, Otisville, I moved to the city. I was living upstate at that point, and I moved back to the city where I'd been working at Henry Street, and um, and be very got very involved with uh, with uh, working with different artists. I worked with. Nancy Holt, and um, I worked with uh, many, uh, Joan Jonas, I worked with uh, Shirley Clark for many years. Uh, I was part of her troupe, it was called the PP Video Space Troupe. And sort of growing out of that work, um, we started, uh, a group of us had a, um, had a, like a, uh, it was really, uh, like like a seminar with Herb Schiller, and uh, and I was I had been working with Liza Bear on a that was the first public access show I worked with with, with Liza Bear and Willoughby Sharp did a uh, public access show called Communications Update, and um, and Liza and I made a film about international communications and. Um, low, low power television with uh, uh, with Michael Cousins, who was the and Perry Teasdale, who was the, they were the initiators of the low power television um, initiation. It was a initiative that the FCC did, which actually then led to the initiative for low power radio. So. Um, but out of out of all that work, we uh, we were. I felt that there wasn't enough people talking about like media structures and the bigger picture of media, like who owns the media and 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 about international media. And so um, I, I we decided we wanted to learn from Herb Schiller. So. A uh, group of us, um, Marty Lucas, um, Daniel Brooks, a number of other people, um, Robin Anderson, um, who had studied with Herb Schiller, we got together and had a kind of um, seminar. And at, at one point I thought, well, we should put Herb Schiller on the on, on this communications update. So Paper Tiger began as a communications update episode. And uh, when I asked Herb, uh, if I wanted to do it as a test to see if we could do it, do like a, a, a weekly look at the New York Times. And, but the, it began as a test for, um, from communications update. 
And uh, it, Herb said, well, he needed six sessions on the New York Times. Um, so we, it, it's divided up into different issues, but those were the first paper tiger shows. And they're all about the New York Times, but different aspects of the New York Times. For example, one is uh, their international coverage. One is their local New York coverage. One is the, um, the Sunday New York Times, et cetera. Uh, the Sunday New York Times, I worked with, um, with Skip Bloomberg, shot that one. It's probably the best shot one of the ones we have. Um, and, um, and it was, um, it, be, it, it seemed like a really good uh, format. So we broadened it out and did, and asked other people to critique other aspects of the media. So for example, Nesta King, who's a feminist ecologist, she did the um, 17 magazine, which is about as far from feminism and ecology as you could hope to get. But it's something that a lot of women, when they were 14, used to read 17. So, and that was the only paper tiger show that we almost had got sued about because um, there was uh, we from, it was playing on on. Um, on, on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, which it wasn't Manhattan Neighborhood. It was just, we had, it was the public access channel at that time. There was no m and And so the, they got a call from the woman who owned Seventeen Magazine, who was one of the Annenbergs. She was, um, uh, uh, I, Lenore, I think her name was, I forget her name, but she called and tried to get the show taken off the air and there were a lot of meetings. We knew somebody who worked at the Manhattan Cable, and they um, they they called. They said that they 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 got this call from this very important woman, and they didn't know what to do. But we were able to keep the show, and and she she we we distributed the show. It became a very popular show. So we're going to show a little sample of Paper Tiger right now hopefully, and, um, and this, this, this compilation was made by Daniel Brooks for uh, a, 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 a presentation he did at the College Art Association uh, about four or five years ago. So I hope you enjoy it. Channel Zero. She won, she won. <laughs> There was a lot of ferment between people who were artists and activists, and Paper Tiger was right in the middle of that. You know, it's media produced by people for other people, you know, as opposed to corporations producing media for consumers. Ted, it's 8.30. Do you know where your brains are? One of the things missing on mainstream media is any critique of the mainstream media. We have, with the Sunday New York Times, about four pounds a weekly reminder that the American economy runs on waste. We were really experimenting with the format. I think what made Paper Tiger a kind of cutting edge art, um, which is why we were shown in like the Museum of Modern Art or Whitney or whatever, because we were really on the cutting edge of, of what was going on with video and art.
corporation spends $75 billion, $850 million on national advertising. That's 579 times the proposed 1986 National Endowment for the Arts budget. Hi, my name is Joan. In the modern world, only power is real pleasure. And Dynasty reminds us between almost every one-on-one -on -one scene with an extreme low angle zoom on an enormous building, think of piles of money with the super rich scheming at the top, while the rest of us become bag people in the nightmare alleys of urban America. Joan Bratterman is a brilliant uh, person who was involved not only as the commentator in the show, but also as the uh, really designer of using chroma key in a, a brilliant way, using uh, switching and uh, amazing kind of effects uh, that had never been seen in the art world before. The backdrop of Renee Tajima is a white man on a camera. What she was saying is that the people who are shooting Asians are all white and they're all men. Where do stereotypes come from? Stereotypes of Asian, Asian people, um, in particular of Asian women. I am the most dangerous man in America because I'm right, and I'm having a blast being right. big business, you have the audience, you have the bands, the artists, the singers, the writers, whatever, who are in the middle. And it's in the tension there. The culture constantly rising up from the people, the big corporations constantly trying to make a buck off it and trying to sell it to us back and forth that creates the tension that makes rock and roll alive and interesting. You know, in this world of sort of like, I think everything needing to look so perfect and polished and and, um, you know, the, the bells and whistle, whistles, whistles of, you know, Hollywood productions and stuff. The Paper Tiger continues to have the, the boldness to be really um, imperfect. In the 20th century, the airways of the world were controlled by a few TV network powers. Overhead, corporate satellites sailed the subspace air, flooding the global channels with their capitalist vision. This eliminated the public's access to communications technology. Refusing to be silenced, cadres of media pirates rose to fight the mighty ships of media injustice and reclaim the rights of free speech. This is the
sponsor with a video I selling me junk that I never want to buy Won't you show me, won't you show me what I ought to see How you suck me, how you fuck me till I can't be free TV guy A thousand glassy smiles for a billion nightly viewers Selling dollar garbage in the media sewers Sell England in America, America in France Sell you back your ass in a fancy pair of pants the following program is a realistic depiction of fictional events. None of what you're about to see is actually happening. Good evening, I'm Frank Reynolds, and this is World News Tonight. Coming up, police flood the subway tonight in another blitz on lawbreakers. But is it working? A tragedy in Alabama raises the question, when should news people stop doing their job and start getting involved? Thank you, Steve. The news is the sharp end of television production. It's the thing that people worry about most, next, of course, to sex violence and kid vids. Um, the news, however, is a, a very peculiar institution. It's... Uh, full of uh, astonishing conventions and constraints. It says it's going to tell us about the real world, but the way it does it is in a very strange, almost fairy tale sort of way. One of the things that news people are terribly good at, and which, as you've already seen this evening, we're not so hot at, is running down to videotape. I'm going to play you a bit of videotape, which I'm sure is quite familiar to you. Can we play it? Now stop it, stop it right there for a second. Let's just look at this, right? This is, the, this is a very typical beginning of a news program. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, it contains in the words March the 9th, 1983, almost the only hard fact you're likely to get in the 22 minutes you spend watching it. This also, unlike the sort of logos that seem to reflect the world and indicate that the news is dealing with the world, this opening title is absolutely honest. It's set in a TV control room. It tells you very firmly that the program we are about to watch has not very much to do with the world, but a hell of a lot to do with television. Let's see how it goes on. Good evening, I'm Frank Reynolds, and this is World News Tonight. That's right, folks, don't touch that dog. Well, I am the from the video. That's, uh, that's an amazing compilation that Daniel Brooks made, uh, probably with the help of his partner, Fiona Bonham. Um, but you can see all the fantastic people who made Paper Tiger happen. And there's so many talented people, who, many of whom have gone on to do a lot of other wonderful things. Uh, uh, but um, the original Tigers, um, Diana Augusta and Penny Bender and um, David Shulman, who now works for the BBC. Diana Augusta is a high school teacher teaching media now in the, in the Bronx. And um, Penny Bender went on to do a, a wonderful series of programs around history for history teachers that uh, the, uh, it was run out of CUNY, the, the social history project, which was quite uh, effective, very interesting. Um, sort of even before Harold, um, 
Howard Zinn, uh, did, they did very interesting. Steve Breyer was the director of that project. But um, there's lots to talk about. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm worried that we're not going to have time to talk because there's so many great people who are here who um, have contributed, some of whom to, uh, to Paper Tiger. Uh, I think I'll just talk about Deep Dish and maybe show like a tiny bit of it because I really would like to have some discussion. Um, so Paper Tiger really, one of the objects of Paper Tiger was to be an example to public access stations um, around the country to, to, because a lot of people would try public access and they, it, it, when they would make a program, it wouldn't look like NBC or CBS. And so what we were doing was saying, you don't have to look like CBS. You are something else that maybe there's a format that is for is right for public access. Maybe it should look homemade. Maybe it should show the mistakes. Maybe it should have hand painted titles. We used hand painted titles and cards uh, and that cranky you see uh, because that um, that we couldn't have we we were paying for the studio out of our own pockets. And it cost more, it would, I think they had uh, some kind of character generator that was another $25 if we wanted to use it in the show. So we said, well, forget that. We'll just make our own titles. So, but uh, people around the country at that time, there, it was very hard to, to super titles and to get them right. And, and to do it live on television. All most of Paper Tiger shows were done live, um, for because that's we we would we use the equipment at a commercial fender at the beginning, which was um, a, a Metro Access, which was next door to the public access because there was no public access in New York City. And they used to run the wire up the stairs and into the um, Manhattan Cable building. It, it was um, a guy named Jim Schladek who had this brilliant idea to do to enable people in New York City to do live programming. So, so we wanted to promote Paper Tiger. Um, not just Paper Tiger, when we, we, we were, people would ask us for, we would go to a conference of public access people and they would say, oh, I would love to show that on my, on our public access because it will show people ways to make programming without having a lot of expensive equipment and, and doing down and dirty, quick and easy uh, television. And so, we, we used to make copies for people. Uh, if they sent us blank tapes, we would make a copy and then mail it back to them and they, if they paid the postage. And we, um, but it got really cumbersome and difficult. There were all these piles around the office. This one goes to Pocatello, Idaho. This one goes to, uh, to, to Chicago. This one goes to, Vermont. So we, um, and I said, well, I think we should see about doing satellite um, transmission. Liza Bear had done some really interesting experiments called send receive using satellites. And so I thought we should explore that. And that is, um, and other, a lot of the tigers at that time were also <laughs> tripping over all the tapes that were in the office. To be to be copied, and they so they um, they they were they really liked the satellite idea. So the, originally, the idea of using a satellite was just to promote public paper tiger. But then we started seeing what was going on around the country, and a lot of it was really good. And we thought, well, why should we privilege paper tiger? We should work with other people and get together. Um, 
a, a net a real network that includes um, pe people from all the different places around the country that were doing really interesting programming, programming about housing, about there was a farm crisis, a lot of farms were being sold and uh, taken back by the banks. There was, uh, in there, of course, all the various military activities. I remember Karen Rogoff did a wonderful uh, one of the, uh, for, in the first series, uh, about a, a, a nuclear ship that was going to come and be harbored in Staten Island. But that was happening all over the country. There were different examples of how the military was impinging on people's life and endangering people. So um, not to mention what they do abroad. So Karen did uh, an episode of the first Paper Tiger series that was looking at the peace movement around the country and the kind of threat to local citizens in terms of the military um, expansion that was going on in the 80s, even though we weren't at, at, at a particularly, we weren't at a war, but we soon, we were threatening Nicaragua and sending in uh, covert troops there. So, um, so, we, so we, we got segments there were, and then the idea of Martha Wallner and Daniel Brooks and, and Karen Rogoff um, were the coordinators of, of Deep Dish and uh, the, of the first series. And what they uh, did was make a wonderful book, uh, a little, um, uh, it's like a, a phone book really <laughs> with contacts. There was, this is all before the internet. There was no internet. We were all, we were communicating by mail. We were sending out press releases uh, uh, in, in big packages. We would go to the, by this time we had a few grants from the New York State Council on the Arts and a few other foundations. And we would use that, most of that money didn't go to the video production. It went to the post office. So because that, that we are, we really felt that the outreach was more important than anything else. And um, so, and Daniel Brooks was a terrific designer and made this great book and also all the material that would go out to the different stations. And um, so that was, that was how Deep Dish started. So maybe, maybe we could show just a little bit of deep, oh, before that, <laughs> I wanted to, well, I'll wait till the end. We'll show Deep Dish a little bit. And then after that, I wanted to show the Paper Tiger with, with Tom Weinberg and talk about um, media burn. So let's look at Deep Dish. We are all dominated by electronic media. For the most part, it's a one-way process. But it shouldn't be a one-way process any more than any means of communication should be one way. So what we're trying to do in Access is to give millions of ordinary people the right to use this vehicle to speak with each other and to speak with the uh, public officials. Most people think of sort of television and the media as a kind of given. But I think that we have to think of it as something that we can influence and we can take part in. We all know how terrible a lot of the media is and how there's a lot of um, distortions and disinformation. I think that making your own media and investigating issues yourself is a way of, of countering that. Okay, deep dish. <laughs> Here's the unabridged explanation of how Deep Dish TV gets to you. It starts with thousands of producers making programs within their communities nationwide. They send their shows to coordinating producers, each in a different region working on a different show. All the edited shows are sent to Deep Dish Central in New York, where we coordinate the network. We take it to an uplink, which sends it to a satellite, which sends its beam back down to this hemisphere in a pattern called a footprint. Cable systems receive the signal in a dish and send it out to their subscribers on a public access channel through the cable system to your house, to your TV, to your eyes. 
This is Alvin on the mic. When I talk, I talk it right. And I'm talking about AIDS, the killer of the night. I know you've heard it all before. This AIDS epidemic killing more and more. As long as there's one ounce of strength in our body, that ounce of strength will be used to fight for this good cause. And in the end, we will win. These, these, these radicals, these anarchists, these socialists, these communists, without them, uh, we would not have had the kind of changes that took place in this country, which were good changes. Because very often, these people, these, these agitators, these radicals, they were the ones who were needed to start things off. I think it's important to explore the potential sources of power we hold within our hands, especially now during this period when it is so important to create um, united fronts against the official um, oppressions that are represented by those in power. The lesson to come out of the AIDS epidemic is be compassionate, but also outlaw homosexuality and perversion in America. Well, I understand you hate um, gays, but what about... Um, I don't hate anybody. Yeah. I just love America. So there's a lot more to talk about and uh, about Deep Dish and and uh, it's and it's, a, it's an amazing uh, intervention and was incredibly uh, influential. I think especially for to, in, to in, it, both it and Paper Tiger encouraged activists to use public access, which up to that point, up in the early 80s, people, there was, there was public access, but it was only like the Wayne's World guys with their guitars in the basement. I have nothing against guitars in the basement, but um, they, that was, uh, that was mostly what public access was. And so, um, we, or the town board meetings, which are great. I'm really glad public access does that. So part of what we did was make the, make series that could be played on other stations and also that would use material from those stations. So that, that encouraged people to, to get, to, to downlink the, the program because there, who knows, like that one of their tapes might be on it. So in any series, like I think we, the last series Deep Dish did was called Shocking and Awful. We had over a hundred producers who, who worked on that series and over half of them were from the Middle East themselves. So it, it was a way of, of, of having activists and people progressive use the media and, and, and use the resources that are there. And then the resources have a serious function and become, and then those people can become advocates for public access and for alternative media. So that's what, but one of the people who uh, I have worked with over the years and who founded Media Burn is Tom Weinberg. And I wanted just to show, he, he made a, a paper tiger show on the Wall Street Journal. And can we just show a little few minutes of that? Because I really feel that I've learned so much from Tom and we've worked together and we, we several times, we almost had a, a, a national network, which was what we were always working for. And, um, and it, uh, the 90s was a terrific uh, thing that he did, and I, I helped with that. But um, let's show Tom at, uh, on the train, which is where most of the people who are on the train read the Wall Street Journal. Let's see. Right on the line. And if we ever run out of checks for him to sign, you can have mine, all of mine. You can have mine. Mount Vernon Station, Mount Vernon. This is Paper Tiger Television. This is the Wall Street Journal. I'm Tom Weinberg. It's Skip, Esty, Dee Dee, Melissa, Jesse, and that was Molly. Money. 
talk for about talk today about the Wall Street Journal, which is really about money. It's not about priests who write books. It's not about drunk driving. It's not about what it's like to be a reporter in El Salvador. It's about money. Okay? I mean, this stuff is interesting to the people who have money. But it's about money. Morgan Bank. It's about the cartel of the sea. I don't know. It's a wonderful newspaper, and I read it about... It comes in the mail every day. And I read it about twice a week. And I read about four of them on the weekends. And then you get done and you throw it away. It's sort of as, you just hate to throw them away because you might, you know, there's something in there that somebody's father-in-law thinks is important. Thank you for sharing all this. It's been such an amazing, just listening to you narrate this history and seeing the compilations. I feel like I'm getting a really good sense of such a massive archive of some amazing work. Um, Maybe I just wanted to jump in with maybe one beginning question, and then, of course, people can can chime in or raise their hand or, or whatever. Um, but I, I was really struck by the way uh, that Paper Tiger formed and just the decentralized structure of Paper Tiger and then Deep Dish TV. So I was curious just to think about how you uh, and your collaborators approached collaboration uh, in general? How did you, um, how did the collective grow over time and who were you um, adding to your group as it got larger and, and how were those connections being made? Because it seemed like it had such an amazing organic uh, growth. And I know some people in this, in this Zoom also are some of those collaborators, so anyone can really jump in. Well, it really um, it grew out of the, the 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 places that we showed, and we were we would always um, have pre a pay, like a table at a public access conference. We would also have have a a lot of interns. A lot of the people who developed were interns. We also um, we, because I was teaching all this time. I was a professor. I in New York, like I was teaching at NYU as an adjunct um, and also a city college, Hunter College and also CW Post. And I would meet academics who became the subjects and then people who worked with them would want to be part of the show so that it kind of gathered people as we went along. And um, it, it, it's so, so amazing like that, that drawing of like, this is how deep dish works, that we had, we have geniuses who were working, who worked with us. Like Mary Feaster was the artist and she made a lot of the crankies at the beginning and she did just brilliant work. And she's also was a great musician. So she did the, um, the soundtrack for deep dish, deep dish, which um, it was very catchy. <laughs> But she she actually composed that. Um, but we we always we had our hands in both worlds, the arts world and also the academic world. And people kind of came to us. It's very sad that that that's not happening now. Um, it's sort of been hijacked, and it's becoming more of a individual thing. And we're trying to figure out how to get to re reinstate the collective and and also to make sure that everything that we did is online and it's not so we're trying to work on that yeah that is that is really amazing i i to jump in based on what you were saying i am also curious what you were alluding to is what uh, the future looks like for um, this sort of uh, community media work. I know that the I, I've looked into the website and it, it's in the process of becoming a, an archive of all these previous broadcasts. Um, but how else do you see uh, this kind of structure of media making transitioning from this videotape era um, to something that we're seeing now, like uh, digital media, uh, the internet, um, 
empowering a lot of people to produce their own content, but in what ways is the legacy of something like Paper Tiger still alive? And in, in what ways is it is it changing? Well, I think uh, I'm I, I think that it's so great that that people who that are are being their own surveillance and catching uh, these horrible things that the police have done to the African American community, and uh, to me, that's like really um, a kind of um, amazing. Uh, Function of who who would have thought in, in 1981 that everyone would have a camera and, and be able to do this? A lot of the reasons we got together was we didn't have cameras; they, they were too expensive, so we had to share. And especially the editing equipment was expensive. So, so that there is, I don't think, I think that it's, uh, I think there's a lot to think about in terms of like what the future is and. I'd love to know what you think. I, I feel like um, it's the young people that are going to lead us. And uh, who knows, I, 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 I'm, I'm now uh, working in radio. I'm on the board of WBAI trying to help, um, help it become um, the, the kind of important institution that it has been in the past. So, and keep it going. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I do think a lot of us uh, younger folk could learn a lot just by visiting some of the programming that that you produced uh, in the in the decades of the 80s and the 90s, because it does offer such a strong model of collaborative work, uh, politically engaged work, and a critique of media uh, and and corporate hierarchies uh, that silence people. But I also wanted to I wanted to bring in a question that Sarah posted in the chat, which is. Um, she says, as someone who has been working for decades as a critic of news media, DD, um, how do you feel about the right um, and their anti-media stance during uh, the recent Trump era? She says, for so long, this seemed to be political territory of the left. But as we know, in recent years, the critique of the media has been sort of a rallying cry of, of right-wing um, independent news media. So what, what do you, how do you consider that? I, I've been thinking about that a lot, and it's very uh, troubling because it's sort of like the uh, they, they it becomes harder to uh, to critique the media when the right wing is is has kind of got the initiative at this point. Um, one of the wonderful takes that we have is the flush rush. Unfortunately, that the master of that seems to be gone and. There's no office now of Paper Tiger to really try to sort that out. I guess they hopefully we'll find it. I think Jesse Drew made that tape. There was a whole group in in the Bay Area, um, Carla Leshny and um, Luana Plunkett, and they they worked on that tape. And it's um, uh, it hopefully we'll find another master and and send it to. Uh, our uh, incentive to media burn. I mean, I think media burn is so important now as a kind of refuge and a, <laughs> a special place for this kind of media. And but I, 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 I a lot of the group. There were so many groups that started out that were critiquing the media, and now I feel like they it's hard for them to get funding <laughs> so for one thing because it's not a very popular subject. Yeah, that's a that's a really great answer. And the the flush rush segment was definitely one of my favorite moments from the compilation because it really captures yeah the the stance of paper tiger and also the amazing effects uh and uh creative ways that Paper Tiger produced media, like the the way that his image became a sphere and got flushed down the toilet, so um, hilarious and also cutting edge, like it says in the in the compilation. Uh, I wonder if if there's anyone um, who's here who who wants to chime in or or share anything um, with Didi. Uh, feel free to just um, unmute yourself and and jump in if you'd like. I have a question uh, for Didi. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, hi Dee Dee, uh, Melvin from Brooklyn. 
great to see you, Melvin. Wow, it's, it's so light there. <laughs> I think it must be a background. <laughs> Flight of hand technique. So the question I have for you, Dee Dee, is that I know you have been, uh, you've been working on this um, uh, Otisville project for a long time. And you were trying to locate some of the people uh, from, your, from the 60s uh, when you worked with them up in Otisville. So I have a feeling that you never know, some people on this call may have some connection. So you might want to put a shout out. But first of all, tell me, have you, are you still looking to connect with those uh, people that you filmed at Otisville? And have you found any of the people that you um, were working with back in the 60s? I, I never, I have, I put out a, a lot of feelers to try to get people. I didn't get, get anyone who was in my film club but I did get some people, several, they're old men now, they're in their 70s, and they, um, and, but they said they, they weren't in the film club, they tried to get in, but they, but uh, there was, it was a fairly large institution with about 600 kids, and there, there were only 12, 15 in the, in the film club at any given time, so um, but they remember the film club and we used to show, of course, show the films to the, to, to the other students. So that um, they, this one guy said he did remember seeing the film and, and very much appreciated them. I, I just want to salute your hard work over the years and your pioneering efforts to uh, bring media to uh, mass audiences. Uh, I've, I've only been able to take a peek at the last maybe 10 years or so of your work, but you're, you go back to the 60s when I was still in elementary school, so. Uh. <laughs> well, Melvin, you have done such what, Melvin works with young people in Harlem and has done some wonderful uh, projects and actually went to Africa with, the, with some of the students and, uh, and then got their stuff on, uh, on one of the Sunday morning programs culture programs on mainstream TV. I'm just following in your footsteps, uh, Dee Dee. Keep up the good work and good luck at uh, WBAI. Well, good luck with you and your work at Fortune Society. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Melvin. Are there, is there anyone else in the, in the room here who wants to ask a question? I, I see that Debbie Redman has been posting some really interesting stuff in the chat also. Uh, one thing she said is media literacy is just as critical to be taught to young people, if not more so. And I think that is definitely true. Um, I'm also thinking of, I'm, I'm glad that you were able, were able to show your early film, Children Make Movies, DD, because it's so clear that um, empowering young people with the tools to make their own media is such an important part of your work. Um, do you have any comments about uh, media literacy now or uh, how that, how that work is going on. I know that's sort of what we're talking about already. Well, Debbie Rudman works uh, at the Philly Cam, which is the, the most inspiring of public access stations around the country. It's just terrific what they do with actually a fairly minimal budget. It's, and they're very, it took Philly a long time to get public access, but once they got it, people were so ready for it. And They've done really wonderful things there and they have an elected board, uh, very interesting uh, group of people make, working there and running the place. I, I, went to, I went to the Supreme Court two years ago with my uh, co-defendant, co uh, Jesus Papaletto Melendez to try to get, um, to clear up the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, which has really lost its kind of cutting edge and is, um, it has the biggest budget of any public access station and pra does practically the least amount of, of, of youth work and uh, very, it, 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 it really has fallen in, in terms of it, what it, it should be the, the lead ship of the, public access movement because they have the most money to play with, but, and they're in Manhattan, but for some reason they've turned to the corporations who defended them in the, in the, in the Supreme Court case and Papo and I lost. It's a very interesting case. If you want to hear 
uh, one of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's last cases. You go to SCOTUS, uh, just Google SCOTUS uh, and Halleck, and you get there's a cartoon of it. it. Put in cartoon, and you'll get the cartoon with the uh, actual audio of the case of the questions and everything. Um, and then, um, and somebody took it and put like kind of South Park people on it. So it's a, the, it's a I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. Somebody made a-, a Put it on the chat, the, the uh, link to that, because it's great. <laughs> Hiya, Tom. Hiya. <laughs> you, you, good to see you. You too. Did you catch that fish? Say it again. Did you catch that fish? Oh. Behind you, there's a fish. <laughs> no. no. It's a fake, I think. Okay. <laughs> but if you want a bite, I can <laughs> lacquer it up. It's already lacquered up. <laughs> can I tell a Dee Dee story? Yes. Fantastic. Dee Dee, this is Tom, Tom Poole. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's good to see you. Tom is, uh, a, Tom is a mystery man behind Democracy Now. You would not have Democracy Now if stop, Tom stop. hadn't gone, hadn't taken all those boxes and bags to the post office to get it on when the satellite was, would fail. And uh, the, the, we were the first people that actually put Democracy Now up on TV. And Tom was the main guy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dee Dee. As usual, Dee Dee always heaps more praise than I deserve, but I appreciate that because it was it was a team effort. So many people, I can I can name a list of people who helped make that happen. But let me just tell a quick Dee Dee story. Uh, early '90s, I was part of a collective, Black Planet Productions, that produced a show called Not Channel Zero. I think this was the first time I met you, Dee Dee. Um, we were having a screening, I believe, if my memory serves me right, as I get older, who knows, I might embellish. Um, we were at Downtown Community Television. We were showing, a, our show was called uh, Not Channel Zero Goes to War, which was the African-American response uh, to what was happening with the Gulf War. Um, wasn't a big audience, but, you know, we had a decent audience. Dee Dee laughed so loud through the whole thing. I mean, she was clapping, laughing, uh, giving affirmation. Um, and then when we had our Q and A at the end, I don't know if you remember this, the first thing you said to us, and this, and we, we were like in our second or third show. So this was like in our infancy. You said to us, you know what I really appreciate about your show? And we looked at each other like, what? You said, it just feels like it wasn't made in film school. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, it was such a deedy answer, right? Because <laughs> uh, she's always been one that's been about subversive media, uh, always been one that's challenged sort of the status quo of media establishment. This, uh, as I've gotten to know her in, over the years, um, you, you've become a mentor, um, someone to look up to, uh, your dedication, your commitment uh, to media. I know I've taught tons of young people to see that very first piece that you did in 1961, to be able to help carry that torch, to have young people tell their stories is still important then and is still important now. And um, just wanted to just give my shout outs to you. And also, and I think everyone who's on this Zoom, I think could attest to this, when Dee Dee does become your supporter or someone she really appreciates or loves, you have her for life. I'm looking at her home right there. I can't, I can think of the countless times that I've come up there with my kids and my family playing with the ducks up in, up in the Catskills. Uh, so many people around the globe have come to Dee Dee parties in July. Uh, so I just wanted to just uh, send my love and my appreciation. Uh, and I'm so happy that uh, we're all able to see some of your work. And there's so much more work. I mean, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I just wanted to say that. Take care, Dee. Thank you, Tom. It's 
you 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 do so much yourself. So thank you. Um, I wanted. To, I think uh, Marion Ross. Is that you saying that you have a couple questions to ask? You have to unmute. Maybe. Hi, I just wanted to oh. say that uh, this is an anecdotal. DD, my uh, mother worked at that Otisville uh, ins institution as a psychologist back in the days. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Wow. I think before you. <laughs> huh. Wow. Mostly what the psychologists did <laughs> was prescribe drugs, but but I'm sure there were some good ones. I, I ended up having to read some of the reports on them, and it, it's really, I'm hoping to do a book about Otisville, and I will include some of the, the I, I, I surreptitiously copied some of the psychology reports and um and i hope to include them in the book along but with it wouldn't have been one of the drugs she was very anti-drug uh yeah we'll have a talk about that sometime yeah i'd like to yeah are there any other uh questions anecdotes stories that people want to share oh yeah go for it Irina. Hi, Didi, how are you? Sorry, I disappeared. Hi. Hey, Irina. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, listen, I, I was wondering, I, I'm always uh, wonder, you know, and I think a lot about your work, as you know, even though it doesn't look like, you know, is so many interconnection in the work that you have done all your life and that you keep doing. So I'm always wondering, are you, you know, you wake up during the day and, you know, how do you define yourself as a media activist? We tend to define you as a media activist. I think you are an incredible visionary because all the ideas that you have been able to develop. Uh, and I keep on thinking in media literacy. So, you know, what is, what is your, like at this moment, at, you know, today at age 15 in the Easter, how I'm making, would you define yourself today? I'm making uh, a maple, maple syrup. No, no, don't stress that. Maple syrup. You, don't, you have no idea. I have to put, feed the fire. I have to go out and empty the buckets. So. But um, I, it's uh, living the good life. Is uh, uh, there's a, the uh, Scott Nearing uh, was one of my heroes, one of my mentors, and um, I uh, he uh, wrote a book on maple syrup, and it's a lovely book, and it's wonderful. To, it's a it's it's sort of finding spring in this terrible. It was what a terrible winter of the pandemic, oh, yeah. oh, and right. going out and finding that the trees are very alive, and are are giving us this lovely syrup. So. It's, uh, it's not media literacy, but it's a uh, country living, <laughs> self, self, uh, <laughs> perpetual <laughs> work. It's working actually. It's, it, it, well, I suppose so. These day you are kind of an activist. Are you keep working on the huge archive that uh, we need so much to. I'm working on collect. trying to keep a good radio station in New York City. That's um, WBAI is very, it's really threatened. There's all kinds, they, they had one coup already. People tried to take over, which they fought bad. And there's another coup that's, that's happening right now. And there's people, it's totally, it's actually horrible because they, they copied the name of the best. There's a very good program on now on BAI. Joanna Fernandez is doing a program oh. at seven every morning. Terrific program. And uh, but these people and her name of her program is New Day, and they these people who are trying to do a coup, they stole the name and they're saying they're doing a New Day at Pacifica and they want to they want to take away the democratic rule of Pacifica and 
turn it, in, have an appointed board, and it's uh, it's really outrageous what's going on. To, and, and, and and to also have corporate corporate uh, underwriting and it's the death of Pacifica if we can't fight that. Uh, who are those idiots? Uh, a guy uh, named Crozier, Bill Crozier, and uh, it's there. There, there's a lot of if you <laughs> Google it, you can find it. It's they're really terrible, and um, it's uh, and and there's they want to appoint four people who have never done any radio at all ever, and one runs a commercial newspaper, but they they um, they 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 have a very fancy web page, so we're trying to we're trying to fight it, so. So anecdotal, can you say a little bit about your past with WBI? How long back are you a, a follower and a, and a supporter well, I, of WBI? I, I, I never was on the board until this last year. So I, I'm just learning about the intricacies of it. It's oh. very complex, but it is democratic. It's, much, it's quite interesting. The meetings are open to the public and uh, they're on Zoom and they have, you know, 50, 60 people on the, at the board meeting. So the board meetings are open, um, which is how Papo and I got involved with MNN because we tried to go to a board meeting to try to get them to reinstate the, um, the, the community media grant. And uh, they, they, it's very close and it's appointed by the director. And um, but we're at M and N, and but it, it, WPI. I got elected. I mean, I, I decided to run for it. So it it is a very interesting to be on a board that's elected, and uh, and it's, it's, it's it, there's now there's a lot of young people on it who it's very hopeful. I think so, and that's what I think the people the the corporate types are afraid of because they know the young people are really getting involved and, and want to help make the AI better. So that's what I'm working on. And and Irina, you should give the address of your, Irina made a beautiful website about me. So you should put that up on the chat. Yeah, I got a challenge for a friend of ours to try to do this life and then pandemic came and a lot of other things. But did I keep on thinking a lot, I'm planning to tell you. If you can talk a little bit about the case, the m and against Papoletto and you and in the environment of uh, of today, if, did, did, did your case have anything to do with now, you know, silencing Donald Trump and that kind of thing? No, I, I mean, we should, um, we should let somebody else ask a question, but uh, and I think we, we're over the hour. For another, I don't know how long we could keep going and Avery can maybe help us, but um, it's, uh, the, I, I think it's, uh, I, I want to, um, Papa and I both want to keep discussing this and maybe make a film about it. So that's that's what I'm thinking of. And, and yeah, there's oh, sorry. Of, there's people on this cow who are also working at M and N and know what it was like and what it is now and know what the problems are. Yeah, thank you. Uh... For your answers, Didi. I, I guess I wanted to maybe ask one or two more questions. If there's anything still percolating in the audience, feel free to chat or chime in. Um, yeah, was that uh, Carmela? Did you have a question? Oh, I'm, I think you're still muted. Can you? Did Paper Tiger influence Bread and Puppet? Or the other way around, did bread and puppet influence Paper Tiger? <laughs> That's a good question. Paper Tiger very they started way before that. Paper Tiger, Bread and Puppet was something I would go to 
starting in the 60s or, and, um, and uh, during the Vietnam War, I was very um, appreciative of them and I made a film about them in, um, in 1974 called um, Meadows Green, which is actually the Museum of Modern Art recently had it um, re restored. I made it with George Griffin, who's an animator. And, um, and, and I always loved Bread and Puppet and the fact that they used painted backdrops. We, we borrowed their backdrops. Our first, uh -huh. our first painted backdrop was a Bread and Puppet backdrop. And, um, and the, the using cheap materials, that's their slogan, whatever, cheap art. And we, uh, we definitely use that, we're adhering to that philosophy. So when we made it, we always put the budget, the paper, the oh, Bread and Puppet right. doesn't put the budget, but they have a, they have a, they have open meetings and they do they, now because of Zoom, they actually, I saw the bread and puppet budget at the, one of their Zoom meetings. And uh, so they're like, we always put the budget at the end of the Paper Tiger shows just to show that you can make media very cheaply and, um, and, and hopefully um, somebody might want to contribute some more money to it. So that was. Uh, we have uh, one question left in the chat from Joan, um, who's asking, who do you think is a good example of someone engaging with new media or, or tech today? That's Joan's question. Uh, it's a very good question. I wish I, um, I, 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 I tried to read a lot of the me, books about this stuff is, is difficult and, um, and it's not all that clear. I, I always like to read, um, I think Fairness and Accuracy in Media is a really good publication. They have a publication called Extra and I think they're very good. Um, and I'm trying to, there is somebody I read recently that I like, but I'm forgetting the name. But um, I don't know. I'd love suggestions from you, Avery. I bet there's somebody you're reading that you think is important. Uh, yeah, it's a, it really is a tough question because there's so much work happening in so many different ways. Um, I would just encourage people to look around. I, I don't have any good examples off the top of my head. Um, but maybe... Um, just for a final, maybe a final closing note um, of all the things that we watched today, I think we saw you once briefly uh, on screen. So I was wondering uh, through your career, when did um, you know producer, educator, Didi become the performer? How often were you on screen and what were the sort of your favorite moments of being in front of the camera? <laughs> Actually, it, it, re, it relates to your question because you asked, there was a point, there was a conference that Patricia Mellencamp organized at the University of, of um, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And she, um, we did a show. I felt that rather than just have it be all these um, academic papers, which most media conferences usually are, we should make a show with the people who teach about television. That the subject of the conference was television, and so, and so we brought all these academics into the, to the room, into the studio, the public access studio in Milwaukee, and a lot of them had never been in a television studio. They're teaching television, but they had never ever been inside of a television studio. Oh my goodness! Oh, look at the lights! <laughs> but we did. I did. Uh, we, we decided that the show would be like a um, uh, a, 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 a TV show, and so I did the weather, and other people did the news, and Ma Maggie and uh, oh gosh, 
the, there was a there were people taking apart a TV state a, a TV actually on the show. It's called the Pedagogy of Television, and it's on it's on Vimeo. If you Google Pedagogy and Paper Tiger, you'll probably get to it. It's a very funny show looking back. But in, I gave this analysis of what was going on in media education around the country and looking at semiotics and whatever other kind of, there was a lot of different la language and lingo that people were using at the time. So um, it, it's uh, that I love, I, I hadn't seen Oh, did we lose Dee Dee? Okay. I think we might have lost Dee Dee, but I put the link to the video she um, was just referring to, so you can check okay. that out. I don't know if we'll get her back, but um, this has been a really great night. I'm so um, honored to have had Dee Dee here and to have had so many of you who are her collaborators over the years here. Um, for this wonderful discussion. And thank you so much to Avery for such incredible questions. Um, and thank you to Tice Jaiswal, um, who ran the tech and is graduating from college tomorrow. So um, I hope you can join us for our next event on April 1st with, um, it's a documentary called Walk with Frank, um, a new documentary that hasn't yet been released that uh, deals with um, destigmatizing mental illness. Um, so thanks so much for joining us and we will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.